India and Germany have a very long, very good very, and very broad based um, relationship. India was among the first countries who recognized Germany, I think already back in 1951. And Germany has always been very active um, to support India's process of development and uh, economic mod uh, modernization. Um, and we have also seen now a couple of um, common interests with regard to international order, uh, with regard to multilateralism. Both countries have a strong interest in and a long tradition in multilateral organizations. We have an interest in a rules-based international order. So we, ha so I think we have a very common understanding as trading nations uh, how important a liberal, a free, uh, in oh, and open international system is. Now, this is a very long, well-established partnership of over 70 years. Uh, so, it, in that context, you have to see that how the changing, um, you know, political equations around the world and for India in particular, uh, not only with Europe, but also in South Asia, uh, also would, uh, you know, seem to be a, a factor or a driver which led to enhancing the engagement with Germany. And the same applies for Germany as well in terms of expanding its uh, you know, partnership options, um, I would say. So that is the first point. The second is, of course, here is an equation which is um, a long-standing equation. And so the, the opportune moment was there to kind of scale up uh, the partnership at this point. Um, I would say so the, the German Indo-Pacific guidelines from September 2020 uh, as well as the coalition agreement of the new German government, which was launched in November last year, both emphasize the importance of expanding Germany's relationship with India and sort of provide the basis and the framework for what is coming next also under the new German uh, government. And as an export nation that Germany definitely is, German foreign policy interests are closely interlinked with its economic interests. So therefore, it's not a surprise that the relationships with India and as well as with China and other big countries are also driven by um, economic interests that Germany has. Germany is an economic and technological and financial behemoth in the world. Forget India. They are one of the large, they are by far the largest player in the European Union. They are huge players in the United States of America. They are huge players in China. They are huge players in ASEAN, in Latin America, in Africa. This is why this is a relationship which for a country like India, which in the year 2027 will become the largest country in the world, one of the five largest economies in the world and are treating the European Union as one economy, it is absolutely imperative that we shore up hugely an old and trusted relationship with especially a partner like Germany with which we have congruences of all kinds, whether it's democracy, it's respect for rights, diversity, etc. But where we have familiarity, a good feeling, and ease of doing business, each and every one of the things. That's why the Indo-German partnership is absolutely an imperative. Indeed, it's been there for a very long time. I mentioned to you so many things in which I have myself been involved. first point one would need to uh, understand over here is uh, Germany's India's largest uh, trade partner within the larger India EU uh, you know and EU is of course uh, uh, also our largest trade partner as a whole so you've got these two uh, you know very positive um, equations which uh, you know uh, have an implication for India so in that context when you see um, you know, the IGC which took place, which was the sixth edition, and India is one of the few countries with which Germany has this kind of, uh, you know, intergovernmental consultation, which means uh, many important ministries, uh, you know, come together in, in this uh, equation. So, uh, one could look at it rather very significantly that the India-Germany strategic partnership came right at the same moment when in tandem, the India-EU equation also underwent a transformation. Because it's sometimes hard to separate sort of the Indo-German relationship and the 
India-EU relationship because Germany plays such a significant role in um, the EU itself, along with France. So India is a central partner for both Germany and European foreign policy in the Indo-Pacific. I think it's one of the key pillars for both Indo-Pacific strategies, which is explicitly also mentioned in the um, EU Indo-Pacific strategy as seeing India as one of the key partners also by Josef Borrell in his, his famous uh, speech and blog post following that. And I think we've seen now with um, the EU-India roadmap to 2025 and the connectivity partnership that was signed last year and the Indo-Pacific strategy that I mentioned, um, they all demonstrate the strategic importance of India for European foreign policy in the region. And I think I think the messaging is quite clear to highlight how important the country with which we have the intergovernmental consultations, how important this country is. This is why uh, Germany has this format only with a few selected countries and India is, uh, I think, in China, uh, in Asia, um, the only other country um, um, uh, compared to, um, the only other country is China. Uh, so it underlines that Germany is giving more uh, very high importance to India um, that we have this format to underline also that we have a broad based uh, relationship. Uh, so it's not focusing also on, let's say, single, uh, sing, sing, single issues, but we are also trying um, to have it on a relatively broad-based uh, level. And this is why I think it's a very important messaging also to underline that the strategic partnership is not only just a piece of paper. I think um, at first this meeting was of particular importance because it was the first time for the new government um, and we, to meet Prime Minister Modi. And we shouldn't forget that um, sort of Modi has been around as long as... Um, now what almost 10 years uh, and Merkel was here for 16 years in Germany so there has been a trajectory that both of them have shaped and so it was a great expectation so as and I think we're still wondering here in Germany how will the new German government be different in what regards um, than what we did before and I think uh, because India has gained such importance in the last two years there was a lot of media attention also on how they're approaching India now um, from a new government perspective. And then of, obviously, we already mentioned Ukraine and, and Russia. Um, the meeting that happened now comes at a very difficult time. Um, and I think in this context, it was very important that Ursula von der Leyen visited uh, Delhi um, on, the, on the sidelines of the Raisina dialogue last month, which was this visit was clearly aimed at reassuring the need for closer cooperation with India despite or even because of what is going on at the moment. And I think the counter visit that Modi made to Europe um, has been followed with particular interest just because everybody was wondering, will this break our relationship with India? Will this, you know, will the relationship deteriorate in this context or will it not? And I think it was a very important signal from Ursula von der Leyen from the EU to say, we're going there, we make an appearance at the most important foreign policy conference that India has, um, and we're strengthening that relationship. So I think the context, of course, like I mentioned initially, was the immediate developments of the last uh, year, you know, specifically three months, but then a little bit more would be the last uh, six months. For Europe, of course, it will be 2014 when, uh, you know, Russia and its uh, Crimea. So when all of those equations are put on the table, We've seen the hectic uh, engagement happen at the international level uh, as a consequence of the war in uh, Ukraine and uh, you know the repeated efforts and attempts by all to, to engage with it in different ways and capacities. So in this context, uh, the fact that this IGC, uh, given the two years of the pandemic, should go through uh, and you know a, a major push towards uh, recognizing what is India's foreign policy and uh, in that context, the sixth IGC taking place, I think, drew a lot of attention. Also, the fact that the prime minister was, uh, you know, subsequently after the IGC uh, in Germany, uh, went to Denmark uh, again, with whom we have a strategic partnership. Then there was the India Nordic, uh, you know, second summit. 
and then finally rounding it off with again a visit to an important country France Well, I think the relationship has changed and it has also adapted to changes in the international environment. Of course, we have to keep in mind that Germany and India are operating in different regional theaters. Um, so for Germany, it took us quite some time to make the shift from what in Germany was called the Asia Pacific region. Um, and which is which has now been renamed or relabeled also with a different context into the Indo-Pacific. The, the Asia-Pacific illustrated, let's say, Germany's more e uh, economic view of the Asia-Pacific region from the area of globalization dating back from the 1980s, whereas the Indo-Pacific as we all know, is focusing on the rise of China, how to cope with the rise of China uh, in this part of the world. Now, as we have we have entered now what is called in the German word die Zeitenwende, uh, so it's the, let's say the, the sea change um, of German foreign policy after the Russian attack on Ukraine. I think we may also have a new debate coming up in how far we also have to foster uh, our security cooperation with other Asian partners. The Germans have a very interesting law, which they are now, I think, amending or they've just amended or whatever, which wouldn't allow them to send weapons to conflict areas, which is why they didn't send weaponry in the first instance to Ukraine. It wouldn't also allow them to participate in conflict areas. In fact, I'll tell you, there's a celebrated resolution at the United Nations on Libya, where the entire West said we should mandate action in Libya. And the Germans said, no, I had the privilege of asking the foreign minister, sir, why did you say this? No. He said, no other reason. Forget everything else. My constitution does not allow me to say that the armed forces can be engaged in places of conflict. As simple as that. I think India has made its position very clear. And to me, this is also very understandable. India is not an actor in the Ukraine war. Yes, this is a war in Europe, as we like to pose it here. Um, but there are many wars uh, all over the place. And I think um, this is something that the Europeans, for the first time, they're realizing how big the security threat is that you can ha experience by a neighboring country invading in another. And I think this is something that India is sadly used to um, with sort of border conflicts on each side. And so I think there's a great potential for, for mutual understanding um, and on a deeper level. And it's really um, up to the Europeans, I would say, to decide what to make of it. Because India has, as I said, made its position very clear. And I think there's no, we, we, we are in no position to force India to take such drastic steps. Was, we German have. industry published a paper on China, I think it was early 2019, where they were very critical of what was going on in China, uh, in how far this is damaging their own um, business in interests. And this um, um, paper has also in influenced a, um, or has triggered a much more critical debate on on China, which also then led to um, different uh, developments in the EU, where the EU is now or has a now much more critical view of China. So let's say the return to geopolitics was also was fostered by um, developments in China. It became obvious that probably we are much more too dependent on China. We have to diversify our um, re relations with um, important Asian partners. So in that sense, I think um, geopolitics has slowly returned to Germany. And of course, it has now received a much bigger push which what which uh, was has happened in Ukraine. So one of the big reasons for that, of course, is where does um, uh, you know if I take Germany, the German landscape, where does India figure on that? Uh, and I think this has largely been a relationship driven by uh, trade and economics. Uh, and there, of course, you will find uh, people who are familiar with that 
but when it comes to the political dimension of this relationship there are far few less number of experts um on both sides and that's probably to do with how uh, germany is located within europe uh, and the attractiveness uh, of each other on a larger strategic landscape uh, and uh, this is why you've had lesser uh, policy pronouncements or scholarly attention there very le- there are very few scholars of course who work on um you know india in uh, in uh, in germany uh so that means there's less um, academic output and that is a reflection of also the political reality where germany is far more engaged with um, the other big asian country uh, over uh, and that is that is china so you find more china experts uh, any day uh and obviously this then draws uh, also attention to the fact that when you have less number of scholarship then you're not able to actually get the best out of the relationship as well because not people not many people are drawing attention to it. so i think that uh, probably will uh, see a shift and that is why i the uh, current igc got the kind of coverage it did especially in the context of war india has become a very important country in the larger context of you know how do democracies work and what kind of equations uh, we built up uh, you know the major powers are building up with others but also with important actors but i think it has to do a little bit unfortunately with the different scholarly traditions we are having in um the two in our two countries um one aspect is or another aspect is also that germany has a strong engagement in india but it's on the economic side and the economic side it's day it's day to day business it's not so exciting uh we, we have all followed when there is a rafal uh, plane landing in delhi this makes the headlines whereas when german uh, business companies do their business and earn good profits and offer job opportunities to the to, uh, for the for the indian people that doesn't really make headlines so germany germans have a little bit of problem we lack the visibility second point is as i said we have different academic traditions keep in mind that in germany we still have about 10 or about 10 chairs it could also be a, a little bit more on in on in dology which is mostly focusing on classical indology so looking at india's middle uh, old traditions on the old languages and scriptures we only have very few scholars at universities only one one or two chairs in germany who look specifically at modern in india so this so you see from the academic side you see a huge discrepancy um when we deal with the ancient india or whether we deal with the modern india as far as i follow in india the situation is similar you have more more people working on the us working on the u on uk uh, because of historical reasons um compared to scholars who work on india in terms of green technology they're leaders they're absolute leaders and they are people that we have no choice but to follow why do we have to partner with them look a we are not technological giants we are good at replicating in very large measure but we have a willingness and interest secondly we need capital cost of capital in india is very high europe is by far one of the more easily accessible areas but we have to do something about the cost of capital and partnering with germans is just definitely one of the easier one of the better ways of doing uh, the fifth igc what they did was uh, there was a big push uh, for um, issues related to climate and urbanization you know issues which are very important for india also in the larger context of the sdgs if one were to place it in 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 that kind of a framework and so germany has pledged uh, you know a huge amount of 1.6 billion euros for projects which will be looking at energy and energy efficiency uh, in uh, natural resource management as well as urban development 
uh, you know they are going they are investing uh, and collaborating in the mumbai metro for example and also in solar uh, energy uh, uh, projects um, if you look at what giz which is the development arm of germany uh, and what they are uh, focusing at in india then you've got uh, energy of course just like i mentioned this environment this climate change this biodiversity we're looking at a sustainable urban and industrial development and of course uh, all of it is encapsulated within sustainable economic development so here uh, you know one can also look at uh, uh, good examples uh, which are there which are on the ground you know i mean that's a policy that you have to look at how was it translating on the ground and you see that germany has been a partner on key initiatives in smart cities a uh, clean india and skill india especially germany's uh, dual edu- you know education system uh, has has uh, become a model in india uh, in the agriculture sector they are having projects looking at uh, you know soil protection and rehabilitation of degraded soil uh, so as to in- improve soil fertility and uh, more recently we've seen a, a big push for uh, you know energy in terms of uh, you know some uh, supporting uh, india's green uh, hydrogen policy as well so i think we've we've seen some very strong kind of uh, action uh, on key sectors uh, which are very important for india the cleaning of rivers very important for us namami gange and all of these projects you know most of these ideas come from what happened in europe and perhaps the best example was the cleaning of the rhine where every single one of these big pharmaceutical and chemical plants was there you had basf at one end you had bayer at the other can you imagine the state of play of the rhine and we call it the father rhine but today when you look at it it's pristine they did it therefore they have not only technology they have demonstrated abilities to be able and we benefit lastly i come to the fact of of you know money the european investment bank larger than the world bank is still held by werner hoyer who is a former minister from germany one of our largest players in the area of metro building in india financing all of this you see credit anstalt for vida of bau care w from germany hugely involved with all kinds of projects in india these are the kinds of companies institutional arrangements which sit well with india but are absolutely necessary as we build infrastructure which is clean green and better suited for the future nobody has really asked where our energy resources come from until the day <laughs> where russia invaded ukraine um, and that suddenly when you realize Oh, probably not so good if we have 50% or more than 50% actually of our uh, energy resources coming from Russia. Um, and we actually, I mean, Nord Stream 2, which is this pipeline um, from Russia to Germany directly, is one of the projects that was initiated after um, Crimea was um, annexed by the Russians in 2014. So we really didn't learn from this, um, sadly. So energy security is taken quite seriously at the moment. and i if you look at what has been done in the guidelines for the indo pacific and in the indo german cooperation program that also focuses on it so it's not just um the ukraine crisis that that caused the rethinking um it, it accelerated the process but really there has also been a thinking around that before so in the indo german government consultations um now in may you could see that the focus was brought on sustainable green hydrogen production um as well as sort of the Indo-German green hydrogen roadmap that was presented uh based on on actual inputs by the Indo-German green hydrogen task force so you can see a certain theme there <laughs> with the green hydrogen um that is supposed to be a key pillar of our energy security um development with India um and you can also see that we're got to food security the government consultation bring attention to the issue through various initiatives um like joint working groups and knowledge transfer because 
obviously this is a problem for India as well. I mean, India is experiencing a drought at the moment or was, and it was very pretty serious. And that's why it would cause the export bans on wheat as well. Um, and so India, who would have been in a prime position to supply some of the um, products that, that are missing on the world market, has now been forced to basically put this export ban in place where because of domestic supply issues. And I think this is um, the, the Global Food Alliance with Germany sort of advocates. This is also something where India would like to contribute. So I think there, there are this, the dialogue definitely enhanced cooperation and mutual understanding. Um, and I think this is something where which will be key pillars of the relationship going forward. So I think, uh, you know, in the larger scheme of things, uh, India and Germany have a very good, uh, you know, understanding on, uh, say, science and technology, uh, development cooperation, uh, academic exchange. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's a scaling up in terms of two things, both uh, what we would call as the people to people contact uh, and, uh, you know, the mobility of workforce. Um, right, we're also looking at uh, skilled healthcare workers uh, who can uh, go from India uh, to Germany. Uh, the pandemic really showed the need for this, and uh, also an uh, an opportunity for uh, you know having a labor movement. So that means better certification on the Indian side, uh, and that would allow then skilled labor also uh, to be able to uh, you know get the benefit of, of uh, going to Germany. Uh, at the academic level, this plays out very strongly in terms of both sides investing heavily into expanding the education cooperation, which has been one of the hallmarks of the India-Germany relationship right from the uh, uh, 50s. So there has been tremendous scaling up. In fact, uh, you know, our um, uh, IIT Madras, for example, uh, the partner country was uh, Germany. The first faculty actually came from Germany. Uh, so today, this is taking forward that time, but now scaling it up in terms of the new requirements of the time uh, in which, uh, you know, technology for India uh, is of utmost importance and is a game changer in terms of changing uh, how India's growth trajectory will take. It's hard to differentiate with sort of German connectivity and European one. And I think um, this is something which, which we have also learned in the last couple of years that um, the financial resources for many things also lie within Europe and the EU. So I think the EU-India connectivity partnership is what will really drive also German Indo cooperation on, on connectivity forward because that's how you get you know businesses to invest. That's the frameworks you can provide. And I think um, in with regard to your question, so the the trans-regional connectivity is quite important in the relationship especially with regard to climate and renewable energy, as I said. Um, and that's something which also sort of features very prominently in, in the Indo-Pacific guidelines um, where, where that is laid out. Um, for example, the, the e Green Energy uh, Corridor Corporation and the Beyond 5G dialogue. So these are the kind of things that, that we, we talk about in the Indo-German relationship. So coming to mobility, look, these are EU competences in the real sense with a Schengen visa, which binds many, many countries together in Europe. These are truly EU competences, but to, you know, get things going at that level, countries matter. Now, in the EU, I would like to say something to you, which is not very well understood in India. The nature of coming together is a nature in which not all countries are Germany in France, but all these countries benefited by coming together. You know, individually, today, Britain, Germany, and France may have an economy larger than India. But tomorrow, that won't be the case. With the European Union, it is very unlikely for another 20 years that we will be Now, banding together gives them a certain scale, which is, you know, it's an advantage. Now, what happens in the, in the European Union in terms of typical negotiations with other countries? The large countries carry heft. But if anyone thinks that they by themselves can carry the can for you, you're sadly mistaken. 
they are a necessary condition but not sufficient stop almost one or two small countries can stop everything but if you don't have the good ones on board believe me the large ones on board you ain't gonna go places so it's a double leg race you need to run with the countries you need to run with the european commission you need to run with the council you need to do all of it well they made it difficult but you know they made it because they know that is the way you retain your supremacy the pandemic has uh, you know also shown the challenges uh, which have come uh, in terms of the dependency on china uh, and i think this uh, therefore opens up uh, a tremendous opportunity now for india uh, to engage in german uh, you know companies and german business and uh, scale up the economic cooperation so india has uh, been uh, you know focusing on uh, you know seeing that uh, the um, ability to do business in india uh, you know uh, is improved because that's an important factor for any uh, business company coming in uh, a big uh, success story of german economy has been has been the mittelstand the small and uh, medium scale industries and there is a big initiative on this uh, you know from the german indian embassy which is also located in in germany and uh, it's also looking at how uh, you know uh, they can fast track so this is an agreement on fast tracking german business uh, entry into india similarly about fast tracking indian uh, business access uh, to germany so clearly there is this moment of opportunity which is available uh, and both sides you know need to kind of engage with that uh, there are still some perception issues regarding india and the ease of doing business uh, so i think those would also need to be uh, addressed um and india also needs to pitch a lot more in terms of uh, you know bringing our states which is where actually uh, you know the cooperation will materialize so i think um just to sort of set the picture right here so on the one hand germany is india's most important trading partner in europe um india imported goods worth of approximately i think 15 billion from germany last year and on the other side India is only Germany's fourth largest trading partner in the Indo-Pacific region. Um so there there is again the I think I use the word quite a lot here but the sort of mismatch um in the relationship and imbalance. And so I mentioned the sort of the big question mark is will India be a viable and feasible alternative to China? Um and so while we while there's certainly understanding of sort of how it's good to be self-reliant and how it's good to to have foster your own production especially also in the defense sector and everything but that is there's a fear here that this leads to protectionist policies that could have negative impacts on doing business in and with India I think India and Germany are natural candidates for a bigger role in multilateralism as we are talking about security council expansion permanent membership but at the world bank imf who every single day, we have something to contribute to the world and the world would be better off and so the two countries being together is not just a coincidence it is a thought on which the two coincide and in terms of their outward polity their global polity are absolutely congruent because both see the same objective and see that togetherness is the way forward for both of them i think both are initiatives which have been very important in the overall context um of indo german relations for the simple fact that they um illustrate our common understanding of the future international order the alliance for multilateralism i think is also a, a, a much stronger instrument because it highlights the need uh, for multilateral cooperation we have seen this also um, in our respective for foreign policies india has always been a strong proponent for multilateral uh, cooperation so has germany i think the main problem will be how to trend or how to implement or how to bring these ideas on the ground we are members of the g4 just like that no not for nothing 
G20, we are members together, not for nothing. In the G20, as we chair it next year, the key players are, of course, the US and China, but so is Germany, because that's the voice which means the European voice goes forward. Therefore, this relationship is particularly and secondly, the G4 relationship. You know, India and Germany closely bound on a reform of the multilateral system. And they are a powerhouse as far as we are concerned. Believe me, much of global heavy lifting that may be required if and when it comes to that, the Germans will be key partners to them, perhaps even bigger than the Japanese. They are therefore integral to our interests of India on the high table in the world. A partnership which, in my opinion, is one of the most important partnerships equal along with the European and other partnership, but by itself with a single country, a particularly significant and important partnership for India. There is an interesting development take, taking place um, that India has since a couple of years intensified its trilateral cooperation with countries like the US, um, also um, with countries um, like Japan. Um, and, and I think we also see it from the from the German side. Germany has has also started such programs. This has all an idea which is has already been floated since some ten years ago. Then it was then it went down. Then it went off the agenda for quite some time. But in, but it came back, and now the two countries will sign an agreement uh, on trial on trilateral cooperation. Uh, and I think this will certainly be a new step also in our strategic partnership. Okay, so the Indo-Pacific is obviously the new buzzword, uh, you know, both internationally and regionally. Uh, and, you know, you could look at it as this large maritime space of, uh, you know, strategic, economic, uh, political and security significance, which I would say is seeing a new kind of contestation of power and influence. So you've got all kinds of actors coming in and this has also brought, uh, you know, Germany into the region. Uh, so it's, um, when you look Look at it from India's perspective, you know, we recognize Germany is not a resident power. It's not a, it's not a resident power over here, but it has also announced its own Indo-Pacific strategy. Uh, and in fact, it has called it a priority of German foreign policy. Now, the uh, strategy came out in 2020. Uh, subsequently, of course, we've had the war in Ukraine, which has kind of also, uh, you know, drawn the attention away uh, from the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and there was uh, this fear that uh, Europe also would turn away, but that has not happened. Uh, now, when we look at where India stands on it, this is where I would see the convergence. India talks about Sagar, that means we both share an inclusive vision. It's not about leaving anybody out, it's about creating opportunities for going uh, ahead uh, together. So India, uh, India's, uh, you know, relation with Germany in that sense would benefit from it. And when we look at Germany's relations with the region, I think they're predominantly going to be dominated by economic issues. Uh, you've had uh, one German ship, uh, you, know, uh, you know, recently Bayern had uh, gone through the region, uh, but it requires more than a ship in terms of having that kind of a sustained presence. So um, the fact is that for India, uh, developments in the Indo-Pacific will have immediate consequences. Uh, therefore, there is an opportunity how both can work together in third countries. Um, you know, India's own development experience, Germany's own technical and financial assistance can bring in opportunities for co-branding. Uh, in third country projects, both in the region and, for example, in Africa. Uh, and I think that would then strengthen the kind of uh, Indo-German cooperation we could uh, see in the larger context. Let me start with the general aspect. I think the Indo-Pacific guidelines underline um, Germany's interest for a rules-based 
order in this part of the world in a very broad way. An important instrument for Germany is the support of regional organizations. So Germany will not be engaged or will probably not engage too much, let's say, in bilateral issues. This is always tricky because we always have relations with all countries in the region. So it's it would be extremely difficult, let's say, to form an alliance with India and to work on, I don't know, uh, one of the domestic hotspots or regional hotspots that that uh, that you are facing. So what is mentioned, and I think this is um, Germany's way to go, is to strengthen regional co cooperation, focus on those security issues, mostly non-traditional se security threats when it comes to climate change, when it comes to in environmental issues, um, to look for regional solutions which are acceptable for all um, uh, uh, member countries of a regional organization. Otherwise, um, I, I mean, if we were going to, let's say, join hands with India to work on Afghanistan or even there, we, we would pro probably have a lot of common interests. But this always would involve, let's say, other foreign policy um, um, calculations from the German side. So I think this is too difficult. But I think when we look at, let's say, the not so controversial bilateral um, uh, regional issues, climate change, um, in environmental issues, fisheries. Uh, I, I think there's there's a lot of topics where India and Germany can also um, make a contribution to regional organizations. Um, I think on the forefront of what both countries want in the Indo-Pacific, it's the free and open and inclusive Indo-Pacific that they're striving for. Uh, which underlines the importance of a multilateral rule-based order that will guarantee uh, free trade and the freedom of navigation in accordance to uh, international law. Um, so what that really means is, and that gets me to the convergences, is that India and Germany both have an interest in walking the fine line between the US and China. Um, and they have been doing so for several years without being pulled into the rivalry and without sort of having to side with either because of dependencies with the other. Um, and at the same time, preventing Chinese domination in the region is also in their mutual interest. So I think the um, divergence here in sort of, the, there's, a, there's a similar threat assessment, however, for India, and I think I mentioned that before, for India, China is a very real security threat, which is at the heart of its foreign policy thinking. Uh, there is no foreign policy, especially regionally discussed in India, where there's not the word China mentioned in it. So this is a real, real concern that goes into every area and every decision making. For Germany, China is still an important trading partner. Um, and we're, I mean, although the Germans are sort of waking up to the China challenge, there has been a great shift in the last two years here, also in public perception of China and then uh, along these like mask policies and the, the faulty masks that were delivered by China and the media messaging that went around it. And so it's not, we're not sort of blind um, towards the China challenge, we're just uh, sort of a bit slower in waking up to it in, in light of the Ukraine crisis. This is just very recent that Germany is also reassessing its own arm export policy. Um, and so this is something which remains to be seen. And I think there is some, some room for further collaboration because Germany is one of the greatest arms exporters in the world. So I don't see any reason why um, India shouldn't benefit from that, especially if it supports the cause of becoming less dependent on Russia, which is actually in our interest. So China, of course, is the big, big um, issue, uh, not only in the Indo-Pacific, uh, but also in the larger global engagement. Uh, India, uh, you know, does not have the luxury 
geographically with China being our neighbor over here and uh, the uh, uh, tense relationship with China at this moment, uh, you know, the fact that you have an economic exposure to China, there has been a uh, political engagement in China and now we've seen the downside of the uh, security uh, dimension of the relationship, uh, in, at least on the, at the border level, on the India-China border. Um, and that has implications how India engages with China and the kind of Chinese presence uh, which grows within the Indo-Pacific, which is also part of its uh, you know, outreach with the BRI initiative, both towards Europe and also to the Indo-Pacific, you know, the, the, the maritime corridor as well as there. For Germany, given that Germany's largest trade partner is China, that means there are these exposures which also creates a vulnerability for uh, you know Germany as well. And the pandemic brought home uh, very clearly uh, when there was a break in supply uh, chains, uh, you know, uh, and also um, in terms of the political environment uh, in China. So um, at that level, I think. There is a point at this uh, uh, currently in the equation where there is a greater scope for strategic convergence, uh, you know, in terms of how to go ahead uh, vis a vis China. They are looking at the engagement in a far more holistic manner in which uh, the political uh, or the geopolitical and the strategic uh, compulsions are also making their presence felt. So that is adding a newer element. So issue coming to China, you know, this was something we would very much have liked the Europeans to be more cognizant. But the Europeans have their had their own interest. Let's remember it's a far off geography. It's a geography which has paid rich dividends to them. Now you can say, has it continued to pay dividends? Look at the price that you are paying, etc. That's a different matter. Realization usually dawns late. But the Chinese were investing in Europe. The Europeans were making good money there. The German economic uh, miracle, why the French economic miracle, more than that. Britain's economic miracle has much to do with the Chinese. The Chinese are investing money in the financial sectors in Britain. So much so for what they talk and so does the United States of America. So this is the nature of those relations. China is also India's largest trading partner, by the way. Now, given these particular facts, the thing was, why not focus on convergence? And let me assure you, I am sure issues of China, particularly after Galwan, etc., were truly highlighted. The Europeans understand that. Note a few things. The European Parliament and the Germans were active players in Hong Kong. Passed resolutions against the Chinese on actions in Hong Kong, on the Uyghur situation. And finally, a agreement on investment protection, which was agreed between the European Union and China, where Angela Merkel had played a lot of behind the scenes thing in December 2020, has yet to see the light of the day. I think with India, it's a general agreement that there is a shift in focus and priority towards India as a partner for Germany and Europe um, as one of the most important partners um, in the Indo-Pacific region. And I think this is very much in line with what I said, the EU stra strategy for cooperation in the Indo-Pacific um, and with sort of our general approach to the region. And I think it's not so much the fact that the government changed, it is more the fact that the circumstances um, changed and the environment changed. And by that, I mean both China um, but also Russia, and very important, we haven't mentioned this here yet, but also China, Russia. There's never been such a geopolitical shift um, that forced us to shape our relationship with various countries um, at such rapid speed. And I think, or I hope, I'll rather phrase it that way, I hope that the sort of EU, India, and German Indian relationship will only benefit. Um, from, from those shifts. But there is a, the, a fast moving uh, uh, calendar to, to reduce the dependency. Uh, and um, it, Europe will have to look at putting its own house in order. So within that context, Germany's engagement in the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, will continue to sustain because it cannot be an either or situation. 
uh, you know, the, the other large actor is China and uh, the war has uh, in Ukraine has pushed Russia and China closer together. Uh, China is the biggest be beneficiary at this point in terms of this kind of an engagement. So Germany is also equally aware of that uh, kind of strategic partnership which is taking place uh, between Beijing and Moscow. And um, it will look at how it can uh, you know, strengthen its uh, partnership. So let me just conclude by saying that on the whole, I think what we're going to see both for India and for uh, Germany and the foreign and security policy cooperation is we're going to see a more diversifying of engagement which is going to take place. We're going to see a strengthening of partnerships uh, and finding new modes and bringing on new sectors to enhance it. So Germany sees ASEAN as the entry point for its engagement, especially in Southeast Asia, um, because we do believe in sort of the non-colonial approach to, to, to the region, in the sense looking at what is already there and trying to strengthen what is there by trying to also understand the needs um, of the region. And I think this has been, the, the German approach to the region um, has shifted from a purely economic one which it used to be many years ago to now a more strategic one um, and a one focused on where can we cooperate in with regard to climate where can we cooperate with regard to energy security green energy um, and so i think that there has been a German and European, quite frankly, reassessment of the entire importance of the region and of saying, OK, look, we're depend heavily dependent on the trade routes and the Indian Ocean, especially. And we're heavily dependent on having free lines, of um, free sea lanes of communication. And we need to contribute to that in one way or the other. By I mean, the pure fact that we have Indo-Pacific guidelines, that we use the term Indo-Pacific, that we put our foot down and said, this is what we want in the region. And that we see, we identified certain countries which we want to work in. And India is certainly one of the biggest priorities, both for Germany um, and for Europe. But the other one, because that's what your question was aiming at, the other one is certainly ASEAN. And supporting the ASEAN-led regional infrastructure in Southeast Asia. You can say geopolitics have Come, come, come back, or a realist turn, let's say, in German foreign policy. However, you may, you may, um, you may phrase it. So, which will also then lead to the point that Eastern Europe, Russia, will of course figure very high on Germany's foreign policy agenda in the years to come. The next region, which is very much, which is of great importance, is the Mediterranean Sea and the um, and the um, um, neighboring states, be it the Middle East with is with Israel, the, the the Syrian conflicts and all the challenges we are facing uh, in this part of the world, the nuclear agreement with Iran, where Germany was very active, and we have of course um, Africa where, of course, we have problems of terrorism. We have the largest German military mission at the moment is in Mali. And we have the challenge of uh, il, uh, of migration over the Mediterranean. So I, I think these are the two, three main regional um, um, prioritized geographies. The Indo-Pacific, of course, is also a, very, uh, also a high priority area. Uh, because as a trading nation, we know that uh, Germany's economic pros uh, prosperity is very closely linked to Asia, to East Asia. Uh, it's also linked to uh, free um, to uh, the freedom of navigation and free and sea, uh, free sea lanes of navigation. Um, so I think this would be, let's say, the kind of priority list that I would. Um, um, mentioned. So we have Eastern Europe, Russia, the Middle East, North Africa, and then the then the Indo-Pacific. And of course, the Eastern European would also include uh, NATO and would also then include transatlantic relations. Yes. I 
I think the crisis in Europe will certainly, let's say, change a little bit of German perceptions because for a very long time, which is often overlooked in India or in the Indian debate, Germany and Europe has been very much engaged to include Russia in some form of a European security order. So we invested heavily in Russia, not only on the economic side, also on the political side, also in confidence building measures. So this is often o overlooked um, following the uh, Russian narrative. Um, so this is why it's quite clear that now that things have changed so dramatically, it will also lead to a rethink in Germany how to adapt to this new situation. But as I said, Germany's prosperity, also your prosperity, depends not so much on Russia, but most, mostly on the Indo-Pacific region. So this is why I think the Indo-Pacific will remain very high on the um, agenda. And I found it quite interesting that, uh, that the, two, the first two meetings of the German Chancellor with Asian heads of states were with Japan and India which is an interesting, um, let's say, implementation of the Indo-Pacific guidelines, because the Indo-Pacific guidelines mention Germany has to diversify its relation. Diversifying relation means also high level political context. So I think it was quite a, a good uh, signaling that also the Indo-Pacific remains high on the agenda that we are no longer willing just to put all our eggs in one basket that is china but we are also trying to intensify our cooperation with trusted partners like japan and and india so, so the war in ukraine uh, you know is is defining in many ways not only for europe but globally and uh, and regionally for us in india as well um the first takeaway in terms of European security is that the entire European security architecture has actually, uh, you know, broken down. Uh, it has uh, war has come to Europe after a very long time. I'm not taking the, the uh, uh, intra-state war which took place in the Balkans, you know, the breakup of Yugoslavia. Uh, this is classic war coming, but this is not classic in the sense what we're looking at is a uh, hybrid war. Uh, so, which means uh, it has shown uh, the the kind of challenges European security faces in uh, being able to take on hybrid warfare. Uh, right. Second is uh, is um, the location of Germany close to the border, the new fault line of Europe, which means Germany has also now become a net, uh, you know, intaker of refugees, which has happened. Uh, so that creates its own challenges in terms of also dealing with the remain the earlier refugees which have uh, come in. For India, um, Russia is also important in the larger equation of the strategic balancing in the region for us, which means that we we need India needs both uh, America and uh, and Russia. They bring different kind of uh, you know veins into the into the equation of the region over here. Uh, with China, so it's not easy uh, for India to you know just um, close the door on that. And 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 the more important point, our our uh, uh, you know challenge over here is that more than 50% are of our arms procurement is from Russia. Uh, so we're also looking at spares and supplies which come from Russia and also from Ukraine. Uh, and the war has meant that there's a disruption now. Uh, in the supplies coming through. So India's own uh, military modernization will also end up with looking at certain question marks, uh, you know, both in the short and long term uh, as, as the war uh, continues. So I think this is where having the IGC, uh, you know, becomes extremely important uh, because these kind of differences can be brought on the table for discussion.